Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and I'm going to be joined by Amanda Berlin, Lead Incident Detection Engineer at Blumera. Me and her are going to discuss how she utilizes SysMom for threat hunting, testing detections by looking at real-world examples and detecting malicious behavior in the wild. She's a longtime cybersecurity professional, and she's going to share with us how she looks at the world essentially through the eyes of a threat detection engineer. So we're going to talk about anomaly detection, and then we'll get into some of those more fine details. And the tools that we're going to be talking about, you'll find links to down below. And for those of you wondering if you can do this yourself, absolutely. I have a video showing how you can use the Sysmon modular and even export all the logs out of your Windows system or view them within Windows itself. You'll find that video link down below if you want to try these yourself. And these are the same rules and threat detection that she uses. So they're open source, they're available. This is one of the things that Amanda participates a lot in the community of sharing all this knowledge and threat intelligence knowledge, because that's how we get better. And that's why I'm doing this video. So you can kind of look through the eyes of someone actually doing this, well, daily, looking at millions of logs and understanding threat detection. So let's get started. <music> So how you doing today, Amanda? I'm doing great. It's a, you know, nice blustery cold weather in Northern Ohio. Same here in Detroit. We're pretty close together. So uh, I get it here and then pretty soon you should probably get a little snow as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> Which sounds like a great day to talk about how to pull out logs from windows using Sysmon. You did this talk and I was like, wow, this was solid. And of course I already, I kind of know you from talks you've done before and then uh, you landed over there at Blumera some time ago, which is a company we use. Definitely yep. a fun, fun tool there. And pulling Windows logs is your specialty. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> Windows by default just doesn't give you good tooling for this. Uh, Sysmon is the glue to bring this together so we can actually get some useful information out of Windows. And uh, that's what Amanda is going to be presenting today. So I'm ready when you are to get started. Awesome. All right, so let's just dive in. Uh, this is one of my favorite ways to start out a presentation. And I'm sure a lot of people watching uh, have either stories to share of this or something that you've faced firsthand um, and the stories around that. So uh, let's call this company Pat's Grocery Store. Uh, my team is involved after a PS exec command runs over their VPN. This uh, triggers an alert to fire and they have servers to start to be ransomware, which is definitely way later in the process than you would want to know about an attack, right? And pretty much too late in this specific case. So there's no Sysmon installed, and you'll find out why that's a big deal throughout this presentation. And for some reason, their domain controllers stop sending Windows altogether. They aren't sending any of their endpoint agent logs, but that wouldn't have mattered because the domain controllers didn't have the endpoint agents installed anyways. The account that was used to send that psexec command ended up being a shared admin user with their Pulse Secure VPN admin account. So same user, same password. That account had zero MFA setup and full domain admin access across the environment. I think the pe people don't realize that the first thing you notice is ransomware, but that's by far not the first thing that happened. Yeah, that is that is the end. Like, that's the you, end if, of <laughs> that's the end of you having a good day. Right, right. Yeah, if 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 something getting ransomed is the first indication that you have, it's not good. Uh, yeah. you definitely have had them on there for a while before that. So, other than the lucky fact that one of their endpoints ended up receiving that PS exec command was sending us Windows logs, we would have been completely blind to all of that activity happening in that environment. And it's always so nice if anybody's had to deal with this before. Threat actors a lot of times offer to give discounts for speedy turnaround. I love which that. Which is, they actually have, from what I've heard, amazing customer service. Yeah. Right. They build a reputation on it. It's kind they, of they do, which about. blows your mind because they're doing terrible things, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I do believe Pat's grocery store had to, had to end up paying the ransom because their backups were also not working for a significant amount of time, and that could <sighs> probably be a total talk all on its own. Yep. And they needed that data on the servers, otherwise they were just going to have to shut down all of their stores, right, and build from scratch. Exactly. So they needed that that server data that was ransomed. And sadly, it's just one of those cases that, you know, you can't, a lot of times we tell people, you know, you should do this thing. This would be a great idea security wise. And sometimes that just doesn't, it doesn't work until 
something like this happens. And a lot of times this is also where you end up getting security budget, sadly. So as defenders, above and beyond all of the other roles that we play, you know, there's strategic thinking, process creation, research, writing, all of that kind of stuff. One of the main goals we have, no matter what vertical we're in, is defending against threats. That's, you know, a lot of times it's in our title. So there's entire conferences, companies, frameworks, podcasts, whatever, you name it, built around those three words. And so prior to 2014 or so, endpoint AV products were just like detections of MD5 hashes. So just plain virus, virus signatures, for the most part, were doing all of the work as the amount of all of the things on the internet just started to boom out of control, right? And that paled in comparison to what we see today. So now we rely on what? AI, machine learning, artificial intelligent boxes, or maybe just waiting for that time that you see a splash page about the server being ransomed. And as enterprise networks grow and hopefully mature, uh, the majority of what we see is largely misconfigured or un underconfigured networks and endpoint security products that just cost upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, right? Like if you look at the budgets that security companies uh, or security teams have to spend on these things, it, it just gets more and more every year. And there's this repeated behavior of just trying to throw money at a problem and hope a new blinky box is going to fix something. Right. I was looking for some magic solution. <laughs> right. Right. Like, I don't know. Our auditors say that if we get this WAF, everything's going to be fine. Right. Yeah. So you you have these blinky boxes that are compliance check boxes that without the time and care and effort aren't going to do a whole lot anyways. Yeah, I see a lot of the blinky checkbox compliance stuff, and that's not where the real security comes from. We have right. to know what's going on on these boxes. Right. Right. And visibility is one of the uh anytime i get interviewed or or write or or whatever um one of the uh you know common questions is you know what do you suggest people do or learn about or whatever uh to prevent you know next year's cyber attacks visibility visibility asset management top two hands yep. down all the time <laughs> know what you have and know what it's doing <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so that being said how can we make sure you're getting the biggest bang for your buck, especially when that buck is free. So Sysmon is free here to save the day. Uh, this is the Microsoft definition up there, just in case anyone wants a, re re wants a refresher. Um, this was also le released in 2014 as a part of the Sys internals suite of products. And ever since then, I'm sure security admins, server admins, practitioners have been perplexed as to why it's not just installed on every endpoint by default. Yeah, Microsoft acquired Sys internals back then. They did. Yeah. yeah. And yep. it, it's just one of those, this is something you need to load on your Windows systems. It was great. Those tools were so popular for years. It was the missing oh, yeah. component of yes. Microsoft for a long time. Yeah, for all admins, right? Like I remember mm -hmm. all the time needing to use Sysmon and, and, and um, uh, Process Monitor and all of those things for uh, uh, troubleshooting, right? Yeah. Like it was just not there and you had to install it as an extra thing. Um, so we'll cover some of the use cases around why we, why we want this, and then we'll dive into some threat hunting stuff too. Yes. So here's some fancy stats. <laughs> um, so enterprise orgs have a lot on their plate on the cybersecurity front. There's fast adoption and move to cloud, which I'm actually just writing about now, like the, the move from exchange on-prem to 365 exchange. And then the last two years, you know, just the largest amount of move from a corporate world being from home, from work to home, right? So you have this huge boom in uh, work from home now, where prior to COVID, a lot of us were in offices. Um, and that attack surface has significantly expanded, right? Now yeah. it's all over the place. You don't have everybody in the office from nine to five behind a firewall. This has created some really interesting challenges because now they're scattered. All my users are, yeah. you, know, you can't even hire someone if you don't put hybrid in the job title somewhere. Exactly. So at least part of their time is not going to be behind your firewall, but behind maybe some consumer router uh, with access to things. So monitoring what's going on in those endpoints is as critical as it's ever been. Oh, yeah. And um, 
you know, as as a former sys admin, that always just like scared us to death, right? Because I worked at a hospital. We didn't have anybody that worked from home, but we did have like physicians that would take laptops home and stuff like that. And they were always, always dirt, like just full of spyware and just all of this yes. crap, right? <laughs> so going from that to like, now everybody works from home is a, is a huge shift. Um, so going based on our average implementation at Blumira, so we would we were seeing like a single digit percentage of orgs that come with us come come to us with Sysmon already installed. So we had so few that now it's just included in our onboarding process, right? Like you want to get Blumira license, like not our free one because that's just cloud stuff. But if you want to do endpoint stuff, yeah, you get Sysmon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it's so helpful for detections and for incident response and it being free, you know, why not? Yeah, so I'm absolutely. A, just load it. <laughs> oh yeah. And I, I'm a huge proponent of using the tools that are at your disposal. So whether they're open source, free, whatever, you kind of, I've always felt that the, the responsibility to whatever organization that I work with to look up those kind of viable options prior to just asking for like capital, expenditure, right? So why not try, like if, if it doesn't do what you want it to do, then you're not really out a whole lot of money, no. right? Just a little bit of time is setting it up. Right, so if you can reduce like time to detection, time to remediation with a price tag of zero, why not? So I'm not one to read slides, so I'm not gonna read this one. I'll let everybody watching since you can <laughs> pause it if you really want to, um, but uh, you know, I, I've i always wanted the tattoo uh, live, laugh, log. <laughs> live, laugh, log. I love that. <laughs> um, I've not made that jump yet, but uh, if I were to get another one, I think this might be a little bit too wordy, but, uh, you know, this could be a possible <laughs> possibility too. Um, so at any point when you have an incident or if you had one or whatever, and you have Sysmon installed, configured, and logging, you'll be able to find your breach scope. Right, I can guarantee you that time to detection, time to response, time, all those buzzwords are gonna be key security metrics that people end up using in coming years. And I know a lot of people are already using it already. And it's one of the best things that you can pay attention to for program maturity. Um, and then I'm sure a lot of people have also heard like the assume you've been breached. Yeah. Just because, you know, in the beginning, getting breached was a huge thing. Right. When it happened to Target, their stocks plummeted. When it happened to Equifax, stocks plummeted. Like they did terrible for a couple of years and then, you know, it all recovered. But now it's just another one of the news. Right. It, the stocks don't even dip anymore. Uh, you it's know, so people common. are less likely to get fired anymore when there's, it's just so prevalent to get breached that people are like, oh, just assume it. And then if you have been, what should you be doing? <laughs> to find evidence of that, right? Well, and that's, as you know, as me and you both work in the InfoSec community with incident response teams, and they're always complaining, as they should be, about we couldn't figure out what happened because they didn't have any logging tools. We know we know the results. We don't yes. know the how. We don't know the backstory. We don't know what led up to it. Uh, there's an absolute lack of information. We just see the boom, the results, the, the disaster that we're dealing with today. But that's exactly. why getting these tools installed at the beginning is so important for that forensics information. Because if you don't know how they got there, you don't know exactly how to prevent it. Exactly. So that being said, we can go on to some Sysmon use cases. Um, first, we're gonna cover some of the specific benefits you can get from Sysmon. So if you're beginning a hunt, more than likely you are inserting yourself into an event related to a Windows host that's in the process of happening, or Maybe like we do, a lot of times it's a retroactive step to find threat activity that's been missed. In either of those such situations, Sysmon logs give you by default an amazing amount of logs compared to anything plain Windows can provide you, even when fully configured. And honestly, way better than a handful of endpoint solutions. <laughs> so this is true. <laughs> yeah. So here you see a difference on the left hand side in the difference of Windows IV IDs and then on the right compared to Sysmon. So there's 10 total types of data that fail to appear if you don't have Sysmon. And then there's others that are possible 
that are extremely difficult to configure to even get a shred of information out of it. Uh, if anybody has ever tried to log DNS from a domain controller without using Sysmon, uh, you have to like turn on debug logging and half the time it doesn't even tell you what device requested, you know, made the DNS re uh, request or it's just horrible and Sysmon just does it for you. It says, hey, this host reached out to this website. It's fantastic. So for threat hunting, what can we do with this kind of information? Um, one thing that we do uh, every now and then is using, and, and, and I think a lot of us take for granted that we do this. So it's kind of just part of how our brain works sometimes. And it's using standard deviation to weed out baseline activity. So this is the normal like curve of standard deviation. And in this example graph, like 90% of the results live in one and a half standard deviation and the rest you can call outliers, that can be really helpful in threat detection because looking at those outliers regularly gives you a good look into some of the less common activities that happen in the environment. Granted, if you take your standard deviation and you already are, uh, already are having an incident and it's been around for a while, it, you know, it's just gonna fall into normal activity, right? So like mm -hmm. you have to have this for a while and, and collect a lot of data to be able to see what is normal in your environment. Um, here, I'm, I just took, I know this is like a crazy graph, but I uh, take an example of some Sysmon logs across all of our customers. And so the Y axis on the, on the left is total destinations. So this is just like IP addresses that things have reached out to starting at 50, going up to the uppers of 500 to 5 million range. And the x-axis shows the standard deviation score. So this, we're taking all process names on devices across all of our customer data set, which is why those numbers are so large, and looking for destination IP addresses that processes are accessing, right? So some of them make complete sense, um, and then we, you know, calculate those standard deviations. So we're going to zoom into this, which you'll get that joke in a second. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that makes sense, right? Yes. Processes zoom. It's reaching out to a ton of IP addresses, Teams, Java, Chrome. Like this makes sense. These are applications yeah. that reach out to stuff all the time. Edge, go to meeting. That's Cisco WebEx. Ring Central, Central, everyone's yeah. phone system. And then we see Notepad, which should Notepad ever reach out <sighs> to IP addresses on the internet? No, no. But good news is that was just our lab. <laughs> 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 um, because if we start to see things in that standard deviation uh, or outside of the, the majority of that standard deviation, that are like this, like that's something that you're gonna wanna, wanna look into. And this becomes different with every customer, right? Like th this is an uh, interesting data set because it's across everybody. Yeah. But uh, it's nice to see that it actually captured our notepad going out to 2 million IP addresses. <laughs> um, another main detection creation strategy we use is uh, adversary emulation. So there's a bunch of tools out there, like Red Canary has stuff. Um, there's Atomic Red Team. There's a whole bunch of different tools out there that you can use. Um, this one is also free. This is called Vector. It's V-E-C-T-R dot I-O. And you can import different frameworks into this. So I'll give you some examples of a couple of things that we started to do. And this is like a heat map of MITRE. So you can import all the things in MITRE, and you can test against it whether your the endpoint agent you use blocks or detects it, or your SIM, or your IPS IDS. Like you, there's so much that you can do to track all of the different levels of MITRE, right? Because there's different stages. You know, it, uh, we used to have the tech, um, the um, cyber intrusion kill chain, right? And now we have MITRE, which I think is a little bit more extensive. But there's all of these different TTPs that people use. And it's good to test these. Now, can you test all of these all the time? Probably not without having 
several staff dedicated to that all the time. Uh, it's really hard to test all of those. But just think about, you know, um, uh, like spot testing this stuff. So the amount of things that can go wrong in any given day with any kind of technology is, you know, overwhelming. But you can pick, all right, today I want to check to make sure I can detect on uh, if somebody installed a new remote access tool. Right, just things that you, I, I always, you know, back in the beginning when I started doing this, it's something that I've kind of, uh, always, always use as an example. Think of the things that keep you up at night. Like, oh my gosh, I woke up in a cold sweat because I just realized that these users don't have 2FA enabled. I don't know if anybody yeah. else does that, but there's things out there, right? <laughs> well, I think it's important too. One of the things that we don't use TeamViewer within our organization. Right. So when we see a TeamViewer install, it absolutely flags, it opens a ticket, it creates error. We, we don't even have to test it because, well, clients test it for us. Yes. <laughs> In, exactly. And you start scratching your head, wait a minute, what, how'd they get, they, they aren't supposed to have admin privilege, so there's the first problem, how'd they get yes. TeamViewer installed? Exactly. Um, but yeah, going through your organization and validating, not just saying, okay, we, we monitor for installs of new files, we monitor for installs of remote tools, being able to actually test and validate that finding is really important. It's a heavy lift to, uh, to ask an IT team, but it's kind of an important one to make sure that those flags are still being raised. Yeah, and, and you can pick, pick like 10 a quarter. Right, yeah. like you could probably do 10 tests easy in a day, um, especially with some of these tools. So like an example is, uh, this is importing, this is, uh, if, if inside vector, this is an example of some stuff that you can track, right? So this is the red team section of this one MITRE technique, right? So this is an example of T1482, and it's people doing uh, domain trust uh, discovery. So you can run this and it's, it shows right in there when you import it, this is actually importing the Atomic Red Team stuff, that the phase is discovery, it tells you what it's about and the trick bot malware uses it, but it also tells you like, these are the commands to run. So you can just go to a Windows endpoint and if you can run this without being detected, that's probably bad. Yeah, and it's the important part because if you have, we'll say someone in your accounting office, suddenly that accounting computer is running this, you're like, that seems unusual. That is not what they run in accounting. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's that uh, back to that whole anomaly detection. This is right. how you have to look at things holistically to say, all right, here's the whole picture. Here's this anomaly happening. QuickBooks, yeah, reaches out to too many IPs and et cetera, et cetera. But all of a sudden that same computer is now running this and they're looking at what what is in the trust list. So this is the instantly starts an investigation flag and getting that data out. Yeah, exactly. And that, and that discovery phase is way before the ransomware. Yep. Right. This is, that's, those are all of the things that attacker, like we just saw one not too long ago where the attacker was using who am I and, uh, and he, like uh, doing user commands via the command line, just doing NS lookup via the command line. There's a lot of like discovery things that most attackers either do or just have scripted to give them more information. Um, and Sysmon helps with that too. Yep. Uh, and this is the blue team version uh, of that same thing in Vector. And it this is like where we'll store, yeah, we detected it. Um, and here's the logic that we used in this specific detection. Right. Um, and you can track those, you know, however you want. And this is just, you know, our, our tagging system in, internally, how we how we track all the all the MITRE things. Right. <laughs> all right. So now that we covered kind of how you can organize that stuff, we can dive into some specific use cases. Um, this is use case, use case one. There's a ton of different ways that process memory can be extracted from a Windows endpoint. Uh, you can run things like Mimikatz locally. You can gain a uh, access to hashes a multitude of different discrete ways. Um, I can think of like five off the top of my head. Uh, here you can see they use com services, uh, which is a com plus service DLL that was introduced in Windows XP, yay, uh, that you can use to extract local hashes. There's a handful of detections and um, a couple of these we'll, we'll cover a little bit that are called finishing moves, meaning the attacker has 
all your keys to the kingdom. The security team's lives have gotten much harder than they ever want it to be. Uh, or you're, you know, calling Mandiant or some other you know, <laughs> IR, <laughs> IR firm to come help you. This isn't necessarily one of those game ending moves, but it does mean that someone has local access to a machine and the files in their possession that they can crack to get credentials to your devices, right? Especially if you're sharing usernames and passwords across devices, uh, you know, it could potentially be the entire environment. So we consider this a priority one threat, meaning that you have to immediately act on it or you should immediately act on it. Um, I do have stuff blurred out in this presentation because they're actually from customer, customer events. Uh, when it's not blurred out, it's me doing it in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> Understand. Yeah. So here we see uh, the exact commands and the timestamp on the device in question. So this is com services. This is the actual command that was run, right? Com services is doing a mini dump, which um, uh, it lists the process ID and then where it wants to store that memory dump and then the keyword full. Um, you see here, uh, let's see here, there's other related findings. Um, and that kind of just goes along with, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens along with this kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I'm going to mention too on that page, uh, the log was from December 7th of 2021. And these yeah. are all local tools that are found on there. We, we, I finally was happy to hear in 2023, Lulbin come part of the common vernacular with cybersecurity, yes. but like, yeah, I mean, cool that we got a name for it. I like Lulbin as a name, right. but it's not that new folks, but threat actors have been using the tools that are available to them for a long time. It's yes. just been slipping under a lot of radars of so how they do that. Well, oh, yeah. these tools are all in there. I mean, they're, they're using built-in facilities of windows to attack us essentially mm -hmm. this is why it doesn't flag in malware scanners this is why monitoring what's going on and from a behavioral standpoint is so critical to cybersecurity and and difficult too i remember yeah. when powershell by default started coming on windows os's and they're like oh well we have to uninstall this like we can't have powershell on every device like how are we how are we ever going to manage security if everyone has access to powershell and then it didn't matter if you uninstalled it or not. Like you could just yeah. you know, reinstall it super easy <laughs> and there was all, all of that stuff. So yeah, like uh, Lulbin's and what is it? Lulbin and Lulbaz, whatever, they changed it or the additional yeah. ones they have now, uh, living off the land, right? Which means there's so much already in Windows that can be used. All right, so this is, this is and I have a couple of examples of that, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, I, I laughed because I mean, I think in 2019, uh, we had our, the last time we had a Detroit speed side, my friend Xavier presented showing how all the live off the land techniques, uh, yes. that how I'm going to, it was a whole fun B side stuff. I'm going to pwn your system with everything you have. <laughs> I'm <not> right, <laughs> right. Which is easy, right? There's, yeah. there's entire attack frameworks built around PowerShell. Yep. Uh, so I, I apologize in advance for all of the screenshots of Event Viewer. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of them, but there won't be too much of a quiz. Um, so here's when we see the incredible differences in native Windows logging on the left compared to a Sysmon install. So even Way if more you, data. oh yeah, even if you can't make out all the specific ones, you can see see just like a sheer volume of information. Uh, event one in Sysmon is the same same kind of as 4688 in just plain windows and it just pales in comparison right and the reason that 4688 even shows up is because we have to configure it in group policy to output those results right you have to do command line logging and process creation to get everything that you need where you just get it in event id 1 Here's an example of um, uh, the specific um, configurations that you can do for Sysmon. So uh, I'll cover it a little bit later, but one of the things that you can do is uh, there's like the Swift on security Sysmon um, configuration. And then there's also Sysmon modular, which is the one that we usually use. And the Sysmon modular actually gives you MITRE techniques at the top of the rule names that you have in your configuration. And then we can, can uh, correlate that to a couple different things. 
The second one down is, like we were just talking about before, the living off the land techniques. And that is a screenshot from um, uh, the actual Sysmon config. And then the next one down is from uh, uh, the Atomic, Atomic Red, Red Team, Team tests. Yeah. 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 So it kind of breaks them all down, and it's kind of cool that you can see all of that, all of the techniques kind of match each other throughout those tools. So in summary, um, this is what kind of the detection looks like. Um, you can, you know, put it in most things that you have for a SIM. So we're looking for Windows Event ID 1, and then we're just looking for command of the parent command line to be that comm services with a mini dump. Granted, maybe you had an admin doing that for some reason, but you're probably going to want to know about it anyways. All right. Yeah. So nice and short and simple. Uh, and then we can move on to use case two. So this is an example I talked about a little bit before, the finishing move. Something you want to know definitely as soon as possible. Uh, another thing that just comes with Windows is NTDS util. Uh, if anybody's ever managed AD databases, that's the utility that's built into Microsoft for doing that via the command line. And it's been used for years, right? You can use ntds.dit, and that's the uh, database of all of your Active Directory user information. And you can just dump all of that information also. And uh, as a threat actor, you can begin exfiltrating that and cracking all the passwords and looking and seeing what the directory forest looks like. Um, I can tell you, uh, I've not had to do this, but um, it was really interesting. The first time I gave this talk, uh, the person, if, if anybody's ever heard of the, my, there's a Microsoft guide on network eviction process. Um, the first time I gave this talk, I'm like, ah, by a show of hands, who has, you know, had to follow this or had to start a forest over from scratch because uh, I don't know if it is still, but that at one time are the two options you have if somebody breaks into your Active Directory. You have to start over from scratch and manually do everything again, or you have to follow this network eviction process. And the person that wrote it was actually in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, all right, well, that's great and uh, he actually told me instead of doing network eviction uh, anymore he's like i just tell people to move to the cloud <laughs> like <laughs> all right it's time to just throw away your on-prem yeah just no more dcs that's it <laughs> i'm like oh that's real interesting um it's so... not an easy place to unwind when when people bury things and hide them in there oh, um man. Yeah, there's there's a lot there. I mean, there's some tooling around it that exists. I believe Bloodhound's one of those tools you can do oh, some yeah. auditing with. Yep. But it's not easy. Even <laughs> even with the tooling, it's it can be a uh, it's a project. It's its own oh, project yeah. to itself after the incident. <laughs> yeah, I would not want to do that. It just I'm glad I do. I kind of miss admin stuff sometimes, but not always. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a day when you're happy you're not doing that. <laughs> exactly. Um, so here in our matched evidence, we see the full command. Right, so ACI NTDS sets that NTDS as the active instance. IFM is, means install from uh, media for like non read only stuff. And then the backup's created, and the two queues are just quitting the previous two commands. And it gives you a nice download of Active Directory information to go crack. Yeah. And with humans uh, tendency to reuse all their passwords and the absolute amazing availability of rainbow tables, yes. they actually don't spend as much time cracking. They're doing more of a matching scenario. Right, right. <laughs> it's, it's much faster than people think. <laughs> yeah, sadly. Uh, and then here are the differences if you, if you pay attention to you know, the Windows logging versus Sysmon logging. Uh, yeah. On the left-hand side, it's just a huge list of 4799 which is just enumerating security groups in Active Directory, which that's how Active Directory works. You do enumerate security groups all the time. Um, a 4688 was generated, and we saw that in the first use case. And then uh, here on the right-hand side, you can see huge wall of tiny text uh, with the amount of information you can gather when that command is run using Sysmon. So the first one is that event ID 1 again. 
Um, it's comparable to the LSAS dump we went over in the use case one. You can see NTDS utils, the original file name, the command that was run from the parent image of PowerShell. It even provides extended information like um, that a newly created process uh, when the command was run and then the full command line. And we also see, um, is it in this one? Yeah, so it gives a terminal session ID. So it shows that I was connected via terminal services when I ran this, as well as I use PowerShell ICE instead of just plain PowerShell. And then here's the first place where we see event ID 10, which is a process being accessed. It's one of those 10 events that isn't included with Windows, no matter what you configure. And then you see this, um, that the source image of PowerShell is using NTDS util. And then event ID 13 is a registry value being set. And that populates when that process actually executes successfully. And you can essentially, there without the sysmon, there's not the entire chain of the event. Right. Yep. Yeah. You get all three chained together for that instead of just enumeration and a process. Um, so again, we see the detection screen with what you can look at as far as the detection goes. NTDS util can be used, again, legitimately across the environment, but it's extremely rare. Um, so you can still look for event ID one and then the process name of NTDS util. And this is just one of our detection versions that has the um, command or parent command that has those two quick commands in it also. Because a lot of times that's pretty much all the script has. All right, and then we have use case three. This is another priority one threat, another living on the land, which <laughs> is ComSpec modifying the registry. So on the bottom there, you can see ComSpec's an environment variable that just opens the command line. So if you type in echo and then ComSpec, all it does is open up cmd.exe. Um, you can't really see what's going on here from the description of the command itself because it's base64 encoded. Uh, but using that ComSpec environment variable along with hidden encoded PowerShell commands is extremely sketchy. I've not seen a false positive yet of this type of behavior. And I say yet because there's, there's an amazing amount of really terrible software <laughs> used in production environments that yes. like to mimic threat actor activity. Yeah, there's, uh, I, I have worked with some industrial engineering people like, why are they basic support yes. doing this? Yes. Why did they thought they were hiding as a secret and apparently they didn't know about CyberChef. <laughs> right, right. And it, it's weird things too. Like I've, I've dug into PowerShell uh, encoding before and it's just been like, oh, we're updating the firmware on this SCSI drive. I'm like, what in the world? Why would you base 64 that? I don't, yeah. I don't understand. Yeah. Anytime um, there's base 64, it's at least raise, raise suspicion on it. Right, right. <laughs> Um, and then kind of a sidebar on that. When I was looking into some data for this, uh, for examples for this talk, I was weeding through some of these PowerShell commands and noticed something really weird. And normally when you see a bunch of words with upper and lower case, you just assume it's like obfuscation. Yeah. So I took that base 64, decoded it and found that it was Matt Graber's reflection method, right? Which is a tech testing tool uh, that bypasses AMSI. So right away, I was starting to worry. I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody's using Matt's like stuff in this network and they're attacking it, whatever. And, you know, it turns out there's actually a really popular tool that people use as an endpoint agent that for some reason, I don't know if they still do this, um, but they were using these locally on all devices as I'm assuming as some kind of let's test our own detections. Um, but I'm not sure it, it's, it's a legitimate like endpoint security solution. Um, and it just made me freak out because I thought they were actually being attacked, yeah. which they were not. So <laughs> that's good. Uh, so back to the use cases that comes spec. Um, and here we can see it's being used to run PowerShell and install on a service. 
Um, normally you see a random service name, but this uh, talk was originally created for RSA, so I had to, you know, make the service name RSACon. And then here we see the full command. Um, and I've already, let's see here, this is on, um, shoot, what event idea is this? I missed it. Um, let's go back. Oh, I think this is event ID 10. Okay, here we go. So this is, yeah, the sneaky way of calling command line. And then you see no profile, the window's hidden, it's an encoded PowerShell command. Um, all flags that make you raise yeah. an eyebrow at it. Oh, so yeah, okay, always. These are window hidden, encoded. Okay, there's something going on here. No profile. Yes, uh, which are common ways to bypass PowerShell execution policy, which turns out isn't, uh, e wasn't even created as a security measure. Uh, execution policies were created as a, let's hope these admins don't shoot themselves in the foot by running these PowerShell commands. <laughs> um, it's kind of like having to type sudo when you do something on Linux. So we're going to look into uh, event ID 8 because we already looked into those other two that were there. Uh, most true positive process injection attempts you can find in both of these uh, sysmon event IDs. This is create remote thread detected and another one that you don't have the ability to see at all with plain Windows logs. And it lets you know here that PowerShell has injected code into DLL host. And you can see it here in the source process as PowerShell and then the target as DLL host. And then the next is 10. And this reports when a process opens another process. And that's usually followed by information queries or reading and writing that address space um, of that target process. And during this attack in the lab, there was a generous amount of both event IDs because the command was run uh, and it attempted to inject into all of the processes. <laughs> uh, so this is just lab data and it kind of shows uh, that the, that encoded content isn't exactly the same as our actual customer event that we had in the use case. So if we dive into that, we take that encoded command uh, at the beginning of this use case, which was base64, and I decoded that. And then I was really confused because it, it, if the top part's where I grabbed it from PowerShell on the, on the left. The bottom is where it got de decoded to, but then it looks even more decoded. And I tried to like double decode it, but it didn't work. Uh, it turns out that it was a base64 gzip file Ah. Right. And then after looking that on the left hand side, uh, I'm like, I don't know what this code is. So I started to look into that decoded gzip and it was Cobalt Strike. Hmm. Uh, and this is one of the methods that Cobalt Strike uses to avoid detection. And another funny story, um, when you include this kind of thing in a presentation, it's best to take a screenshot of it as opposed to just copying the code because it turns out that a lot of places, uh, it was very hard to email and share this presentation <laughs> and no one it. could open it because all the endpoint agents were freaking out thinking that I was trying to use Cobalt Strike hidden in you know a keynote file. That's yeah, that's great. So you had to make sure uh, it's an image. Yes. Yeah. So definitely learning learning moment for me there is to always just take a screenshot. <laughs> yep. Um, and then here's a summary. Really, just look for Comspec. Right. Yeah. Super easy. No one Nothing ever does good that. Nothing is happening if Comspec no. is running. <laughs> no, it's so weird. It's just this environment variable that you'll rarely see, um, and is worth detecting on as a threat. Uh, so now that you're, you know, everybody's a little bit more familiar with event IDs and Sysmon, we're going to tie it all together in a customer exchange compromise. Um, I won't replay that lab because, you know, that's going to be another million uh, screenshots of Event Viewer. Yeah. Uh, but this is uh, an example of Proxy Logon, which came out in 2021. Proxylogon.com explains all of it if you really want to know. But it's basically just a remote code. Um, execution that as long as your exchange server was open on port 443, uh, people could attack you 
right? So it, it generated tens of thousands of breaches of Exchange Online. Uh, well, so many exchange. incidents. Yeah, people's on-prem exchanges. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so not too long ago after, I mean, I guess this would have been a year ago now, uh, we had a customer come to us and ask for help around a notification they received. There's two MSI files that are installed on the Exchange server. Other commands were being run that they didn't think should be running. Uh, and there were actually 11 rapid fire findings. And so you'll notice that's the next, you know, several slides as they all happen in rapid succession. First, you see something along the same lines as that process, process injection we talked about in the other use case. So we basically have PowerShell being run, injecting into DLL host, and acting alone with nothing else. It could be something not super terrible because we've seen legitimate, server, uh, legitimate software do this before. But then you get something like this which is a discovery command, again, on its own, not terrible, but this is netgroup dom domain admins, which is a command to find all domain admins in the current domain. Uh, helpful for admins, right? Also yeah. helpful for attackers. <laughs> yeah. If you only um, have a couple admins and you're all looking at each other going, who's looking up the rest of us? <laughs> right. Uh, you start to be like, all right, well, that wasn't me. Uh-oh, that's... That's not good. Um, and then here, you have a little bit more suspect activity. Granted, this is something I've done before, right? You need to transfer files, and you just decide, OK, I need to open up SMB and transfer from one to another. Not great, especially if you're doing it to a domain controller from your Exchange server. Um, very bad, right? Like That's definitely somebody just copying stuff back and forth. Even the fact that they could do that means that something is not set up properly. Um, but yeah, you know, this is when they started to really freak out. We talked a little bit already about PowerShell encoded commands, but this is something that happens in malicious PowerShell all the time, is that net, um, net web client. So you can, you know, a couple lines of code in PowerShell call and execute strings like it'll download that string and execute it right super easy um it's seen all the time and then finally you see this iis web service process spawning another child's process so in this case it was powershell and associated with that full exchange compromise this did full turn into like a full ir response investigation but without the use of sysmon who knows how long it would have been to see that compromise, right? It could have been you way after this. It happening, right? Oh yeah, you would you would have just had a ransom exchange server at that point, right? And then with that last um, detection of IIS, so if you have on-prem exchange, um, definitely be logging your IIS logs and your process logs on your IIS server. Um, that W3WP exe is the exe name of IIS, which um, uh, the what is it Outlook Web Access uses, and it should never spawn PowerShell or command line. <laughs> never. There are no circumstances no. where that is a no. good thing. <laughs> no, there's unless you are being maybe being pen tested, but uh, well, above and beyond that, that is a terrible thing to ever and then Even then you let them know we found you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, rip off your blindfold. There's a lot of different things you can do. Um, you know, you can have a gap analysis and figure out where you, where your quality of logs are now versus where you want them to be. Um, do you have critical devices? that are not logging the right stuff, you have to plan for a lot of these attacks, which can be daunting because there's attacks for everything, right? But one of the first things that you can do is improve the processes of, you know, include installing Sysmon, right? Um, it could be a change in configuration. You can align these with company objectives, like, um, almost everything in security can be tied to something in your business, all right? Whether it's reduced downtime, um, 
money savings, whatever you want to tie it to, um, you can usually align this kind of activity with bolstering like your security posture. Right? Um, something that we uh, created and it's out there for anybody to use is called Poshim. Um, one of the most difficult pieces we had in the beginning of starting Blumira was installing all this stuff uh, at scale, right? Because you can use, uh, we use NXLog, right? Which has its own configuration file and Sysmon, which has its own configuration file. But if you're not paying for them, you have to have like the, the right configuration or it doesn't start or you have to have the right logs being generated or it just like silently fails. So we were tired of having to do that and figure out, all right, well, this server has IIS, this one doesn't. This one's a 2016 server, this one's a 2012, whatever. Uh, this actually just does it automatically, which is super nice. Um, yeah. It figures out what channels you actually have and puts it, just shoves it into a config file. So it makes it much, much easier. You can, you don't have to have Blumira. Uh, to use this, you could just, no. you know, plug in whatever you want. But yeah, it was uh, much easier to just do that than manually. <laughs> uh, and then pick a configuration. Um, you know, a lot of times you saw the enrichments that Sysma Modular gave us with all those uh, MITRE TTPs that it lists. And the it, it gives the ability to turn on and off certain levels of logging, especially um sysmon isn't made uh for all devices right one of the one of the things we ran into is if we had a, a couple customers that had really old servers with spinning disk drives mm. like their dcs were just you know some 10 year old box on the floor um the amount of iops that sysmon has to use to write all of those dc logs that are coming in kills the drive it makes it very slow yeah so if, if you have ssds you're probably fine um but just know that sysma modular is out there so for the slower devices that we have you have the ability to not overwhelm them if you really really want to and i always include this too always test your always test your sim um how, whether you're doing it yourself, whether you have a third party doing it, having an active relationship with, with your MSP, MSSP, SIM vendor, or whoever, there needs to be some kind of regular verification that you're, attack, you're, you're detecting stuff, right? Whether you have a pen test or whatever, there's just so many things that can go wrong to make detections break, right? Service stops, a firewall rule gets implemented, something, right? Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do to test. Like there's easy password, password spray stuff out there. Um, there's just real easy commands that you can run a command line to test it. Yeah. It, one of my favorites, and I did this when I was doing a Blumera demo is you can just go to who am I and you'll notice it'll flag that because <laughs> this is not something commonly run. Uh, the testing doesn't have to be that hard. Uh, my favorite way to test is get some accounting firms and have them as clients. There's a secret class. They give all accountants that say, click on everything that comes through your email. <laughs> I'm convinced of this. I don't know what the class is called, but there's something about accounting firms. <laughs> Great. Because, you know. They're oh, they're man. quite vicious as I have named some of them. I'm like, this person will click on anything. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Accounting for I don't know what it is about that particular industry. Really? They're, uh, I they're thought sales industry. was bad, but <laughs> uh, that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. yeah we need some industry stats on what's yeah, it. Yeah, I know, we, right? That'll be yeah. a great panel discussion. What's the worst industry for clicking on things? Yeah, we have to ask no before. I'm sure they have stats on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and then last but not least, if you want to do your stuff in, internally, this is a great combination of tools to track what you're detecting and how you're detecting those things. Um, and that's it. Yeah, Vector, yeah. Aramic, I'll make sure there's links to everything uh, so it's yeah. easy for people to click yeah, on everything yeah, in sure. the description. Yeah, so this is me. Um, thank you so much for having me on. I love, oh, I love this doing this great. stuff and I love, you know, preaching the great word about Sysmon. <laughs> well, it's fun. This is this is such a deep discussion on 
you know, we started with some of the theory and then some of the practical as you go through it and understanding the big picture, if you will. It's not just the commands that are run. This is like the whole top to bottom right. of why you need these things, why we need some of the alerting and how we're looking at it as security researchers. I think it's just, it's critical because I get that a lot with the, as I'm sure you do with the younger people starting in newer in their career. Well, how did you see that? Or what made you think about it? And, uh, that's where this theory and anomaly detection really comes into play. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I definitely suggest reading up on if anybody ever has um, uh, walkthroughs on instant response. Right. So like either they've seen an attack in their lab or they've seen an attack at a customer and it's been like anonymized or whatever. Um, they're always really interesting to read like the really technical, well, at least to me, the really te <laughs> technical versions of those because you can actually see oh my gosh, like they went from this process to this process and that's how they did that. And uh, the, the better articles, I think anyways, tell you what to detect on in yeah. those areas. Right? And I spend time reading different reports, you know, it's good, good reading. There's uh, some great sites for that. And one of them was interesting. I, I posted last year, I can probably find a link and leave that down there. Um, they had actually gotten a treasure trove of a weird differ report because it came from the threat actor. They were actually monitoring a threat actor. So they got to walk through what their day to day was really? of how they were doing it. It was really cool. Um, I put it on LinkedIn a few places. Uh, I, I can't remember if it was um, recorded future one. I think it was recorded future okay. who actually published it. It was a great read because very, very detailed. And it just, they had logs of everything this person had done, how they made their notes on how they attacked, what was successful, what wasn't. But this is how we update our threat modeling for what you should protect against. Cause I'll see people kind of go off and really worry about this or that. When they look at their threat models, I'm like, just read different reports. You'll understand. Yeah. Because you only have finite number of resources, yeah. uh, people get excited about f some of the physical layer stuff. Because don't get me wrong, go into a hacker conference and you watch someone like J Street give a talk. You're scared, you're blown away, you're amused. Yeah. But honestly, he is probably not in most people's threat model. Of right. the, it, it's just uh, from our day to day with all of our businesses, it's not physical. It's always phishing emails and, mm -hmm. and some of the silly stuff. Hey, lock down, use security cards. Don't let people tailgate. I'll agree with all those things. But if you only have so much resources, putting a better door access system in probably um, they're, they're getting in through phishing. That's the most likely. Once you solved all the other problems, then work on the other stuff. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, Thank you for this. This was a lot of fun. I love diving into these things and all that fun stuff. Links will be down below and thanks. Awesome. Thank you.